Welcome to Caleb Can't Read. I'm Jordan Rabel. And I'm Caleb Terrence. It is a nice sunny day. We've got our little lattes. Yeah, we do. This is going to be another, probably one of a handful of sober Caleb Can't Read episodes. <laughs> what a bummer. <laughs> and so is today's subject. No. Okay. <clears throat> no, so... um, We've relocated how, here. Yeah, we're... We've relocated, yeah. We've relocated. It, it's still going to be echoey as the studio gets built. We have carpet in here, though, now. This There's is pretty carpet. nice. I know. It feels good on my toesy woesies. I, li- I really like how you phrased that, like we like intentionally moved to like a different studio. That was <laughs> no, very I clean. moved to a different house. <laughs> moved to a different house, yes. <laughs> With a better extra room. The fucking staircase is not like, I don't know about recording a podcast up here where we usually have two to three beers at least. Yeah, two to three. <laughs> <laughs> okay, for you. Minimum. And then And then like <laughs> there's a two to three drink minimum. And then minimum. go down a steep ass staircase. And then go down steep carpeted stairs. Well, put your hands on both rails. I'm too small to reach. <laughs> J.M. Barry I'm on actually, the podcast. I'm actually, I'm really not kidding. I can't reach both of those rails. I was trying on the way down. I was very scared. That is so sad. <laughs> um, I don't have the wingspan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> not quite the condor you uh, fluff your chest out to be. No. <laughs> well, uh, let me ask you, Caleb. Uh-huh. How, how, what's the most inebriated you have been while using a firearm? While using a firearm? Yeah. You were and there. I, <laughs> and let me remind you that the statute of limitations in Oregon for a misdemeanor. Statute of limitations. Yes, is two years. So we can talk about past crimes as long as they were two years old at minimum, Caleb. Right? Hmm? I think so. Okay. It, t- yes. What year is it? I, shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> this is a segue into our, <laughs> <laughs> into our subject. Um, I feel like everybody at least more than, you know, more than two years ago, of course, I feel like everybody at some point has been buzzing and and fired a firearm for fuck's sake. Like, no, who has gone camping in Oregon and not had a few beers and then shot off a Glock? If you have a farm friend, which we do, it's, it's come on, man. Yeah. Come on, (laughs) bro. He's, if you've got a friend out on a farm stockpiling like it's Waco, you know, (laughs) officer, I needed cans to shoot. What? Come on. We had a scarecrow. It was so much better when it's human shaped. You know? <laughs> oh god. <laughs> well, let's get started, shall we? Yeah, man. Hopefully that doesn't get in trouble. <laughs> I don't know. It was more than two years ago. William Seward Burroughs the first was born January twenty eighth, eighteen fifty seven in Rochester, New York. His oh, mechanic oh, William Seward Burroughs the first. I don't we can't sit by the window, man. Things are moving and it's distracting me. It's our only natural light. Well, turn the light on in here, man. I think shit, the wind blows, and I can't think. Yeah, this is a lot better. Like, you really have to, like, force me to pay attention. This room is so much darker now. All yeah. right. Well, anyway. So. There's even trees out there. You man. know what? You think I'm going to look at them? Let me start over. William Seward Burroughs I was born January 28th, 1857 in Rochester, New York. His mechanic father instilled in him. Don't. Mm, his mechanic father instilled in him. <laughs> did I hit a little, did I hit a weird little spot? Nobody wants there? that. Nobody Nobody wants that. slurping noises? No. <laughs> it's not that, that is, kind of podcast. <laughs> maybe I wasn't thinking about what you wanted. Maybe I just wanted a little bit of this latte. His mechanic father instilled in him an interest in machines as he had grown up during the Industrial Revolution and knew that with all the new inventions being made, they still had room for improvement. So William got a job at a bank when he was 18 years old, primarily to review ledgers and make sure that there weren't any errors, basically double-checking everyone's math before things got filed. But it proved to be tedious, as people were evidently getting worn out throughout the day and making more and more mistakes. After seven years, William and his wife, Ida, moved to St. Louis, Missouri by advice of a doctor who told them to move to warmer climates for their health. Always seem to have been the go-to for some reason. There, William worked in a machine shop run by a man named John Boyer, not only repairing machines, but inventing new ones. William's crowning achievement was the adding machine. Now, there have been versions of calculators in the past, but like, like they... A, like an abacus? Uh, no, this is an adding machine that does numbers for you. It's a calculator, okay. basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There have been versions of it in the past, but they were all pretty broken. They would come up with wildly wrong answers if you got beyond simple digits. Well, in 1885, William Burroughs perfected it, and he also, in this year, had his first child, 
Mortimer Burroughs. The next year, Burroughs founded the American Arithmometer Company along with his former boss at the machine shop, John Boyer, and by 1890, almost every bank in America was using their adding machine. He would go on to improve upon it four more times before his death in 1898 at the age of 41. He also managed to invent the electric alarm clock just six years before his passing. Well, soon after his death, his partner John Boyer renamed the company to the Burroughs Adding Machine Company, today known as the Burroughs Corporation. For his work, William Burroughs was posthumously inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame in 1987. Sick. Episode over? Are we good? Yeah. Is it, wow. <laughs> Great. Cool. Let's go to the bar and let's go watch Evil Dead. Not yet. No, hang on. Okay. Now, unfortunately, with William's death, he didn't really get to see the success he'd made, but his family still retained his stocks and rights to the inventions. I swear to God, if you go over a calculator manual with me this episode, <laughs> it's the whole thing. That's a good idea. <laughs> anyway, so here's the man who invented math. <laughs> <laughs> well, his son Mortimer... I don't have math dyslexia. <laughs> it's not Caleb can't count. <laughs> count the fucking... Uh, actually, no, I don't have anything If we keep there. it to basic edition, we should both be fine. <laughs> Pretty much. Anywhere past that, I think we're going to be a little embarrassed. I did okay. Not according to my teachers, I mean, but according to me. Okay, that's I pretty bad, because well. if you did okay, then it's even worse now that you're out of practice, so. Mm-hmm. I don't want to go into it. <laughs> you're probably at a Caleb reading level, but with math. Ah, fuck, don't put it that way. That's true, though. Yeah. Well, his son Mortimer and his wife Laura raked in the cash, so they never had to do anything with their lives. Their son would make history as one of the most controversial names in literature. Born February 5th, 1914, and the subject of today's episode, William Seward Burroughs II. Mm, Always rich kids. Does the name ring anything for you? Uh, I'd be a little surprised if it did, but I I mean, okay. Now we know William's dad, Mortimer, came from a background where his dad wasn't really present. You know, always working in a lab rather than spending time with his family. But as it would turn out, William's mom grew up quite the same way. Laura Lee grew up in a family where her dad was a Methodist minister and all attention went to her brother, Ivy Ledbetter Lee. Sounds like Bedwetter. Ivy Ledbetter Lee? Ledbetter. Mm, the proud Bedwetter name. Yeah. <laughs> all right, off to school. <laughs> Don't get bullied. <laughs> nobody <laughs> nobody will ever bully you, Dudley Manlove. <laughs> <laughs> anyway... Her brother Ivy was in the newspaper game, and he was successful at it too. Came he came up with the idea of the press release, where a company puts out their version of events when something goes wrong before the reporters have a chance to get it wrong. He ended up being the PR guy for the fucking Rockefellers. By the hmm. time William the Second was born, his Wait, own is he a lizard person as well, or was he just representing them? Oh, he, he's a definite lizard man. Definite lizard. Definite person? lizard. Blink man. sideways. <laughs> Like, oh yeah. Well, we never even saw him blink. Okay. (laughs) By the time William II was born, his uncle Ivy was spinning the public image over what was called the Ludlow Massacre, where coal workers went on strike in Ludlow, Colorado, and John Rockefeller Jr. had the National Guard set fire to their tents at night, then shoot them all as they fled, resulting in the deaths of 21 people, including women and children. Oh. So that's the kind of mindset William's parents were in. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> He's, he himself said, quote, The lizard mindset. Yeah, he said displays of affection were considered embarrassing. <laughs> oh. I feel that a little. <laughs> you know what, Jordan, I feel like, you know, I've established I have a lot of issues with uh, privileged people, and I, I feel like you're just going to reinforce that this episode. Are we sure we want to do that? <laughs> yeah, hell yeah. Dude. Okay. okay. <laughs> fucking eat them I all. I don't think I'm going to walk away from this in a, a better <laughs> mental state than I was I don't think you're going to really be on this guy's side. (laughs) (laughs) No, I would imagine it was from getting no attention from mom and dad that the young William S. Burroughs began toying around with the idea of magic and the occult. Oh, God damn it. And according to him, he got, he did get some of it to work. So he's not just representing people that killed like people that were striking. He's also into mystic horse shit too. Uh Uh-huh. (laughs) <laughs> oh, he said some of uh, he saw some apparitions like a green reindeer and a gray figure in his bedroom. Jesus. But he didn't find any of this frightening, probably because he was lonely, you know. Okay. <laughs> Burroughs' parents. I think his dad made him in a lab intentionally to fucking piss me off. <laughs> Holy fuck, dude. Fuck this guy. <laughs> Burroughs' parents sent him to a private school called the John Burroughs School. No relation. 
where he published his first paper in the school zine in 1929 at the age of 15. It was a research paper on telepathic mind control called personal magnetism. (laughs) (laughs) Go on. Let's go. I'm here. He was later transferred. Yeah, we don't need any beer. I'm ready to go. This is fine. We'll do it this way. He was later transferred to a boarding school for rich boys called the Los Alamos Ranch School in New Mexico. Yeah. Hey, we're not going to go over the telepathic. I honestly I couldn't study. even I couldn't find it. It was everyone giving oh. mentions of it. And honestly, had I read it, it probably wouldn't have done much for me. He was taking it from a scientific you don't standpoint. Think it could have, oh. Yeah. Scientific standpoint? Telepathy from a scientific standpoint at the age of 15. So it's not possible? <laughs> yeah. This is what it must have. Oh, well, that's But I feel like it was probably longer than a page. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. Not possible. <laughs> <laughs> pa- paper done. <laughs> now, William had an older brother that went to the Los Alamos uh, Ranch School just before this. So when he went in 1930, right after he graduated, uh, I think his, like, to their parents, it was a pretty important thing to put on this air of superiority by having their kids go to all these fancy schools but William just wasn't interested he said they woke up at six in the morning and they'd do calisthenics and horseback riding basically with this idea that they'd grow up to be the ideal tough American man but by the end of his first year calisthenics uh, stretches they did gymnastics I know what calisthenics is do you know what what? calisthenics is yeah just like bodyweight exercises yeah that's what they did. They did yeah. that in horseback riding and probably not a lot of math. You, know? <laughs> you get strong, but you don't get like super jacked or anything. No, no, no. But by the end of his first year there, William fell in love with another boy. And while he knew to keep his feelings a secret, he wrote them all down in a journal. But luckily he burned it before anybody had a chance to read it. God, could you imagine what they'd do to him? Oh. Hey, there's the psychic gay boy. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think he would have had a fucking chance. <laughs> now, rumor has it, and this may have been started by William himself, that he got kicked out of the Los Alamos Ranch School for getting high on chemicals in the science classroom. However, by his own... What admi- chemicals? Huh? What chemicals? I didn't ask. Anyway, <laughs> any fucking, a little curious. I, I don't know. And, and fucking, honestly, if he was a 15-year-old sniffing around, he's not going to be like, oh, cool, yeah, turpentine. You know, he's not going to know. He's just open up, up things and just, oh, yeah, that does it. <laughs> just doing whippets or brake cleaner. They keep brake cleaner in science labs? I don't know. Why? I don't yes. Know. Yes. Like, you know, yeah. In case you need to clean something real good. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, that's, yeah, it's all in the teacher's. And hallucinate. It's all in the ter- uh, teacher's drawer, though. He's got airplane glue in there. I don't know why. Spray paint. Don't know why. You know. <laughs> You know, at least I'm there's sure. enough guns if it's back in the day. But. <laughs> I doubt that there weren't any guns on the ranch school. There had to have been many rifles. Yeah, true. <laughs> However, by his by William's own admission, he simply felt alone and wrote to his parents asking that if he was going to be alone, could he just be alone closer to home instead? No, that's not how being alone works. But, you know, he's like, look, if I'm just going to fuck around and be in my room anyway, like, could you just let me be in my room? Like, if, if I'm not going to talk to anyone, what does it matter, you know? And by the way, the Los Alamos Ranch School is no longer around because it became the barracks for people working on the Manhattan Project about 10 years later. So, that's neat. Has nothing to do with this story, but I thought it was cool. Hmm. So, anyway, William S. Burroughs ended up graduating high school in Missouri and moved on to Harvard University at age 17 in pursuit of an art degree. Now, he was stationed in what was called the Adams House, which, although newly built by the time he went there, had too much of a gothic feel in its design, so it was left to the underclassmen because of its bad vibes. They just, Spooky. Spooky they just thought, Yeah, they okay. thought it was the Frankenstein house, and they didn't want to go, basically. Hmm. However, as it would turn out, the Adams House is the perfect one to be admitted to because the front door is actually in a blind spot to the rest of the school. <laughs> So you could leave past curfew and sneak back in, and no one would be the wiser. Think of all the gay shit you could get up to. Oh, yeah. This quickly got exploited by the students, including William S. Burroughs, who used the opportunity to visit a brothel and lose his virginity. Nice. God bless him, you know? <laughs> was that even illegal back then? Oh, yeah. Is it? Was it legal? Was that even illegal back then? I, I believe it is. Uh, oh, fuck. You know what? I, mean, I don't know. If there's a whole-ass brothel, like, how legal can it be, really? <sighs> I, right? I don't know. I really don't know. Like, or is it one of those situations where, like, you're not just not allowed to have sex well, at, like, a particular school? Well, it, and here's the thing, though. If it were illegal and you're in a town 
adjacent to Harvard, good fucking luck shutting it down. You know, <laughs> you're making all the money from college boys. Yeah, that's true. Like, <laughs> and and laws don't count for rich people. No, exactly. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, it was probably under the table legal at least. Yeah. 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 <laughs> now, while Burroughs was at Harvard, he was employed by a newspaper called the St. Louis po- St. Louis Post Dispatch as a cub reporter. And for whoa, this, whoa, whoa, whoa. he was a cub reporter. That's all that matters. What does that mean? It basically means intern and journalist. They, like, they don't have to pay you. Cub reporter? Cub reporter. Yeah, that's what they call Man, it. They... I, <laughs> that sounds... Don't be mad at me. I'm just... <laughs> that's just what it's called. It just sounds weird. I, I know. I wouldn't, I don't, just like, a what? <laughs> Fucking what? Like, <laughs> no, I must be a Weeblo reporter. <laughs> I gotta work my way up. And for this job, William would be covering police calls. So he'd have to be there whenever the cops were called somewhere, I suspect with, like, an old-timey police scanner, probably. But the work was not only tedious, but gruesome. So, like, when a child was reported as having drowned nearby, Burroughs was expected to go. But he was like, fuck, I'm not doing that. So the gig was over pretty quick. I really want to look at dead kids. I don't want to look at dead kids, you know? He's like, no, I'm... (laughs) Not for me. Burroughs soon took unsupervised trips to New York City, where, as an outsider, he was welcomed with open arms within the gay community. Places like Harlem and Greenwich Village, where he'd later get his start as a writer. Well, after Burroughs' graduation from Harvard in 1936 with a bachelor's in arts, majoring in English at age 22, his parents put him on a monthly allowance of $200, the equivalent of almost three fucking grand today. Wow. Monthly. I think that's about like what I make monthly. Me too. I <laughs> what an asshole. <laughs> Fuck him. I have to work really hard for that. No. I'm really lucky if I can work hard for that. I will oh, say man. I'm in a job now. It took me time, but I'm in a job now where I don't scream on the way to work. So I, I'm at Is least Is that because usually you're just working from home, so it's Oh true, yeah, from yeah. the bedroom to the office. <laughs> yeah. Ah! Fuck <laughs> Yeah. So he would, he, yeah, he would make almost the same we do if he doesn't get a job. How does that make you feel? Feel pretty good about that? Yeah. 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 Yeah, good, good for him. Good for him. Good his, for you. At least his, you're making good use of it. <laughs> Going to the brothel. His parents were able to provide him with so much income because right before the stock, stock market crash of 1929, they made the decision to cash in on what remained of their holdings in the Burroughs Company for $200,000. Oh, they just happened to, huh? Uh, well, what? Like, they had a dealing in it? They just got rid of the rest of their, their stocks. They're like, fuck it. it it's about $3.2 million today. Okay. Yeah. With cash in his pocket, the young William Burroughs decided to go to Europe. Now, initially, William had the intention of practicing anthropology and medicine in Austria. But for the few classes he went to, uh, it, that eventually fell through. Just wasn't for him. Instead, he enjoyed the burgeoning... LGBT community, and he seemed to really flourish there. He picked up young men in communal steam baths, at clubs, fuck, in the street. So he went for school and then he just started partying? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And how would he ever do it with three grand every month, you know? Such a, such a lovely community of gay people here in Austria in the mid to late 1930s with nothing bad about to happen. Well, one oh. day... <laughs> One day, Burroughs runs into this chick named Ilse Clapper. She was a nice Jewish lady, about 14 years older than him, and she told him how she's had to flee Germany because of some guys over there in her government that seemed a little anti-Semitic. And William was like, well, shit, that's in Germany. Nothing bad will happen here in Austria. Now, they were never romantically involved, but William S. Burroughs and Ilse Clapper went to Croatia to get married just so she'd be able to get a visa to the United States. Hmm. And of course... And then he could pretend to be not gay? You know, basically. Like, I don't think that cared. That he cared about... I mean, sometimes like, I'm sure you gotta pretend back then, even if you don't care. Oh, probably. Yeah, like, yeah. At least to people you didn't know, at the very least. Yeah. Like, ha, like two beers deep in. Though like, I traveling, would, I don't think you could just be, like, openly gay with yeah, your partner, yeah. dude. Like, Let me go to Eastern like, Europe. <laughs> Let me go to Croatia and talk about how gay I am, and this is a fake marriage. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah no, no. I know. Um, so, yeah, uh, no, just, like, you know, to apply for this apartment, and uh, who the fuck is that? Uh, my <laughs> friend. <laughs> and, of course, William was very upfront about the whole thing in letters to his parents, and they were also, of course 
a bit skeptical towards the whole thing. They really, really did not want their rich son to marry some woman over a sob story just so she could divorce him and get a shitload of alimony. But it didn't end up that way. Just make her sign the thing. I, You know, I don't know if that's a thing in Croatia in the 1930s or not. I don't know. Well, yeah, but she's trying to get the citizenship to the U.S., right? Yeah. So, oh, yeah, true. Make, well, I don't yeah. even know if it was a thing then either. I don't know much about okay, I don't think they have to be history. married in order for them to, like, come here. They can just go to the U.S. and they yeah, get yeah. But married. Either way, it didn't end up that way. Ilse, uh, Ilsa moved to New York without him. They stayed married from 1937 until 1946, and then they split, and she didn't drag him through the mud. They actually stayed friends via letter for several years afterwards. Anyway. It's pretty easy to keep it not toxic when you're not actually in a relationship with each other. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine so. Well, when William himself returned to the U.S. in 1939, just missing some pretty important events that would be happening in Europe over the coming months, he tried to stay busy with menial jobs. Salesman, exterminator. But the boredom led to a slow mental decline. It all came to a head when William was uh, trying to impress a guy he thought was cute. So to catch his attention... He cut off the tip of his pinky. <laughs> you know how it is. <laughs> this will get it. <laughs> word got back to his parents. It got his fucking attention, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, word got back to his parents, and they still didn't get involved after this. They just kept an eye on him from a distance. Like, they didn't urge him to go to therapy or anything. That would be too... Like traumatizing. Did they even have like therapy therapy back then? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But but if they did, that would be weird to the family name, you know. Like people, the word would get out, right? Mm-hmm. But they definitely knew he wasn't well. They're just gonna watch him from over here, though, like few states away, you know. <laughs> just getting ready to cut him off. Just maybe. A couple of years later, in 1942, right after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, William signed up for the U.S. Army. Now, granted. Due to his very articulate background, Harvard, world traveler, family's rich, he expected to be enlisted as an officer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying he's not. I mean, I, it I'm usually not, works out that yeah, way. Yeah, I'm not saying he's he's right in assuming that, but given how his parents brought him up, I'm sure he did expect to be treated better than others, just like he was everywhere else. Yeah. But instead, William was designated 1A, infantry. Because, yeah, I mean, he also has to have, like, education, right? Mm-hmm. And he never finished that, did he? True. Well, no, no, no. Yeah. He, he did graduate Harvard, but oh, w- okay. with, like, a bachelor's in arts. That's <sighs> going to help, you know? <laughs> but, no, this the news that he was just going to be in regular-ass infantry, that absolutely fucking destroyed him. He, <laughs> you know what's really going to destroy him? <laughs> <laughs> Shrapnel. <laughs> <laughs> he really thought it was going to play out the same way it did in his head. Well, his mom was a little shook, too, and I don't know if it's because she assumed he'd get a higher rank as well, or if she was literally just finding out that he enlisted in the first place. Probably both. A bit. But either way, she got Burroughs rejected from the army when she brought forward evidence that her son was a little crazy. You know, the cut off your finger to impress someone. Kind <laughs> it's of like, crazy. Burroughs, you've been excused. What? Why? Your mom called us and let, you, let us know that you were a very special boy. <laughs> Her little special boy, and you always would be. Didn't, <laughs> didn't the same thing happen to H.P. Lovecraft, though? Like, I think he tried yeah, to no, enlist. Yeah, no, his mom in, got him out. Yeah, he tried to enlist in, like, World War One, and his mom was just like, absolutely not. And they're just like, <laughs> it, which is funny because, <laughs> especially in these times, you know that they had to have gotten those phone calls a lot. But there were only a few people that they were like, look, dude, I, I, this woman is absolutely insane. I think we have to let him go. <laughs> like, she may come down here with a fucking bomb if we're not careful. <laughs> but here's the thing. William's acceptance letter from the Army came quicker than his discharge notice. So he was still shipped out to the Jefferson Barracks outside St. Louis and basically had to twiddle his uh, thumbs. Male. He had to <laughs> He had to twiddle his thumbs for like five months before a doctor could come and evaluate him once they got word from his mom. Was he actually mentally unfit for the Army? It's hard to say, since the neurologist that inspected him was apparently a family friend and could have easily been saying that William was nuts as a favor to his mom. Well, while he was awaiting discharge, William got to know a fellow recruit who happened to be from Chicago. And this guy really fucking loved Chicago. Like, I don't know, like, I don't, like regardless of, like, whether or not he was, like, mentally, like, doing well. Like, if the guy's been doing nothing but, like, 
being in the party scene for however long. There's no fucking way in hell he should be going to war right now. I mean, you say that, but it doesn't take a very physically fit man to get shot, you know? <laughs> you can just not go very far and get shot, and that's all they need, really, you know? Mm. <laughs> Um, but yeah, this this dude he was talking to loved Chicago, loved it so much that when Burroughs was discharged, he decided to like instantly go to Chicago instead of back home to St. Louis. He bummed around in uh, Chicago for a bit, taking on a multitude of menial jobs like he had before. But when he learned two friends of his from back home, Lucien Carr and David Kamer, were moving to New York City, Burroughs hitched a ride with them. Now a little backstory on these two friends of his. Burroughs had known these guys since childhood, as all three of their families could be categorized as St. Louis elite. Lizard people? Yeah, all of them. Okay. Lucian, Bur- um, yeah, Lucian Burroughs had known through school, but Lucian had met David when he joined his Cub Scout troop at age 12, and David was leading the troop at age 26. Now, I looked, oh, into, I looked into this. Oh, why? I, why did you look into that? <laughs> because. I need to know. I looked into this, and, and by all accounts, there is no evidence to suggest that David ever molested Lucian. But he was very upfront that he wanted to. So, like, I, I can I can almost definitely say he was never molested. But it it, it anyway. <laughs> Still, David and Lucian hung out. Mm. He, they hung out all the time like best friends, just this child and a man. And they were a well-known one-sided love story in their community that followed them their entire lives. Everyone knew it was weird, but no one did a fucking thing about it. And no matter where Lucian went to school, from the Phillips Academy in Massachusetts to Bodwan College in Maine, even to the University of Chicago in Illinois, which is where they met up with their old friend William S. Burroughs, David just followed he would get a job at, as, like, a janitor or something, which is probably very alarming. He's like, no, 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 I only want to molest one child here. Like, <laughs> Now, it was in the University of Chicago that Lucien Carr was found with his head in an oven, which he explained away as a misinterpretation of an art project. Oh, whoa, okay, fucking lead with that. Uh, he, well, when you just say if he's found with his head in an oven, then it sounds like he just straight up died. He was knocked out. Yeah. They found him that way. Okay, yeah. <laughs> he said it was a misinterpretation of an art project, but Lucian's mom thought it was because this creepy fuck had been stalking her son all his life, and he wanted it to just end. So she called. Yeah. She called asking Lucian to move with her up to New York City. You know, get away. I don't think she knew that Dave. Like, I don't think David was the reason Lucian put his head in an oven. Lucian actually liked David quite a bit. That's why when he made his move up to New York City and picked up William S. Burroughs up along the way, he brought David Kamer with him. Like, he was like, hey, bud, I'm going to move up to New York. You want a room? And he's like, hell yeah, dude. You know? <laughs> Can you imagine how pissed off? Wait, was his mom? His mom di- thought he was going to leave David behind. Can you imagine how pissed off she must have been when he showed up with the guy? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, honey, you're going to have a whole new life. Oh, hmm. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, fuck. Lucian Carr was a sociable guy, and he quickly established a group of friends with some of the locals there in New York City. There was a young writer named Jack Kerouac, a young lady named Edie, whom he introduced to him, her roommate Joan, and a man named Allen Ginsberg. Together, they would form the foundation of what would be called the Beat Generation. What's with that look on your face? <laughs> I just, I don't know if I like where this is going, but let's go. <laughs> Me neither. I hate all beat writers. <laughs> so it's a couple years later now. It's 1944, and William S. Burroughs is 30 years old and living in an apartment he shares with three other people. The 22-year-old Jack Kerouac, someone else we'll cover someday. The also 22-year-old Edie Parker, Jack's first wife, and the 21-year-old Joan Volmer. Now this next part... We'll delve into this a lot deeper. I mean, he's 30 and just living with a bunch of people in their early 20s? Yeah. Oh, God. I, Can you hey, fucking imagine? Well, yeah, but he's one of those guys is also bringing along his own molester, too. Like, his own personal molester. Like, this red flag's you know, popping up all over the fucking place. All of place. these guys are bad. <laughs> yeah. Just like, Jesus Christ. Yeah, all of the fucking old guys are bad. <laughs> 
Fuck. No, no, no. I'll get into it. We'll <laughs> and we'll get into this uh, a lot deeper when we do our Jack Kerouac episode because although William S. Burroughs was technically involved in this crime, Jack Jack Kerouac had a much bigger role to play in it. But basically, David Kamer's obsession with Lucian Carr turned obsessive, even violent. As oh. Lucian was hanging out with all... Oh, it turned obsessive. Mm, oh, yes. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> like, I see. A good yes. editing point on my, on my... Yeah, I wish that you were there reading it before I put that in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it became more obsessive. As Lucian was hanging out with all these cool new guys from New York, David got jealous. Burroughs even once caught him trying to hang Jack Kerouac's fucking cat. His cat? His cat. Had it, like, hung up on a fucking string, was trying to kill the cat. Which, first of all, weird way to kill a cat. There's more than one way. <laughs> that, oh, mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I refuse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and just once, fucking lined it up. Once, he was caught as he was leaving through Lucian's window because he'd already been watching him sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, that's so much worse. <laughs> so one night... Get the fuck out of here, man. I got what I needed. (laughs) (laughs) I'm done. So one night, David bumps into Jack Kerouac, who asks if he's seen Lucian. Jack tells him he's at a bar, where David and Lucian then meet up and then go on a walk in Riverside Park. At some point during their conversation, David attacked Lucian, and Lucian, quite poetically, stabbed David to death with his Boy Scout knife and dumped him in the fucking Hudson. (laughs) <laughs> damn yeah <laughs> I do like that he still held on to that Cub Scout knife though you know like <laughs> Jesus fucking Murph. used to just give kids knives <laughs> that's fucking crazy too I bet it was like one of them little like was it like a we should look this thing up was it like one of them folding like Swiss yeah, Army knife type been. deal I don't how the it, fuck it you pull a, that shit out in a fight no, dude no, if somebody's attacking no, you no, you're no, not gonna get that out of there I don't think it was a Swiss Army knife I think it was closer to like a pen knife where it was just the one fold them ups kind of thing you know yeah. It's probably got the logo on it, all cool and shit, made of plastic, and he's just, ha da, 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 you know. <laughs> Jesus. Well, Lucian returned to the apartment with David's bloody pack of cigarettes, which he tossed to Burroughs. When he and Kerouac asked what happened, he told them. William then flushed the cigarettes down the toilet and told Lucian to lawyer up and turn himself in. But instead, Lucian clung to Jack for help, whose advice was more, we can get away with murder if we really try. Now they were... I mean, have you ever tried? I'm just saying, we don't know. I, my Tomorrow's open for me, you know? <laughs> it has to be way easier in, like, what is it, the 40s now? Yeah, 1944. It's going to be way easier then. Yeah, yeah, I know. I've thought about it. <laughs> now they were, of course, caught, and both Kerouac and Burroughs were charged as accessories to murder because Burroughs did technically fail to report the murder, though his sentence was more of a slap on the wrist in comparison to Kerouac's. Burroughs was kept in jail as a material witness, but was bailed out by his family. Jack actually helped dispose of the murder weapon, though, so he was going to be in there for a while. <laughs> like, so, actively was trying to yeah, cover up a murder. Yeah, like, he, like I, I want to say he found David's glasses, and he, like, buried those, too. You know, like, he was hiding evidence. You are you go to jail for a while when you do that. <laughs> <laughs> so that left just William, Jack's girl, Edie, and her roommate, Joan Vollmer, in the apartment. Joan was born February 4th, 1923, in New York State, where she stayed most of her life. She had met Edie at the West End Bar, where they decided shortly thereafter to room together in the Upper West Side. Their apartment would become a central hangout point for all the alcoholics, prostitutes, musicians, and drug addicts that would make up the Beat Generation. Now, Joan had married a law student named Paul Adams. had me until the end there. (laughs) <laughs> what the, the oh this sounds like oh fuck they're beat poets <laughs> uh, now Joan had married a law student named Paul Adams in 1944 same year as the murder of David Kamer and soon had <laughs> soon had a child in August named Julie her husband Paul was not a friend to the beat generation though he actively despised all these goddamn beatniks just a year into their relationship in 1945 Joan Vollmer asked Paul for a divorce, which he was more than happy to accept. He had actually just returned from war, having been in World War II just long enough to see it end, and when he came back, found Joan addicted to Benzedrine, 
an amphetamine which had been introduced to her through Jack just, Kerouac. You've just been partying this whole time? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> My friends are dead. <laughs> Other people were like working in factories and shit. What the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> so yeah, he, he, he comes home. She's addicted to amphetamines and it's like, oh cool, your roommate's husband, Jack Kerouac, fucking gave you amphetamines. Got you hooked on. Huh? That's, that's fucking super sweet. Yeah, a divorce sounds cool, actually. <laughs> Well, I'm just going to go be alone. <laughs> Burroughs, Burroughs uh, had also found himself addicted to morphine around this time, and knowing that Kerouac was the guy who introduced Benzedrine to Joan, I'm going to go out on a limb and say he probably introduced Burroughs to morphine as well. Well, either way, once Joan and Paul's divorce went through, she and Burroughs started dating at the suggestion of their mutual friend, Allen Ginsberg. Now, Alan is someone I only mentioned in passing before, but he was basically the guy who orchestrated the entire beat movement. He was able to get anything he wanted, typically by meeting people in different friend groups and realizing that someone from friend group A would do really well with someone from friend group B, and then introducing them in order to make something new where he could kind of hang out behind the scenes and reap some of the benefits. He was kind of like a lifetime producer, if you will. He got the stuff organized. He, he would organize parties and make sure certain people met other people to see if something would happen, basically. This is just like matchmaking? Why are yes. you describing this so friend, weirdly? Friend matchmaking. No, I didn't think of matchmaking. I thought this That's was like why. a normal thing people did. I mean, kind of, but he was definitely trying to make money off of their endeavors. How would you make money off of that? Because if they end up becoming a band, which happens sometimes and shit, he would be like, cool, man. Hey, I'll be your manager. You know, (laughs) shit like that. He was an author himself, but he was more influential as an orchestrator in affairs for the music and art scene. Like when he introduced Bob Dylan to Andy Warhol, that kind of shit. Well, Allen Ginsberg thought the heart of the beat movement was in that apartment with William and Edie and Joan and Jack whenever he may may make bail. But he wanted the bond between all these players to strengthen. So he told William to date Joan Vollmer, which he did. In 1945, with Jack out on bail, he and Burroughs decided to sit down and write a story based on their experiences with the murder they'd been a part of. Not a true story, mind you, but inspired. Now, if you don't quite understand inspired, what... Inspired, so it wouldn't be something that could, you know, presented. Because <laughs> their court case court. is probably still a year away, you <laughs> know? Yeah. <laughs> if you don't quite understand what the Beat Generation is, maybe you can understand the kind of people they are when I tell you the title of the book. They called it And the hippos were boiled in their tanks. (sighs) Ew. I know. The title has nothing to do with the story, of course. It was just something Burroughs heard over the radio one night, and he thought it sounded cool. That's basically what the entirety of the beat movement is. is like, hey, I know it doesn't make sense, but does it sound cool? It apparently came from a news report. I mean, to be fair, that is like the majority of things I like. Yeah, but they have to be cohesive, too, you know? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they have to kind of make sense. Yeah, totally. I know that word. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck. Move along. You know, all right. Apparently, though, the, the news story he had heard, it came from this news report where a circus in Egypt caught fire and the poor broadcaster was just crying like, and, and, the, and the hippos were boiled alive in their tanks. And Burroughs was just like, cool. You know? <laughs> Did they eat them at least? I don't know. Maybe. Um, I imagine that would be like, It'd be a pretty shitty way to cook a hippo. There's like way too much meat. Yeah, there. Like the inside yeah. would be Don't all boil it. Oh, it'd be gross. It's Without gutting greasy. it first, also. Yeah, Actually, yeah, no, it wouldn't be edible. What a weird first thought that you had there. <laughs> I don't know. Have you ever eaten hippo? No. All right. I guess point made. I don't know if anyone has really. Oh, They're pretty I'm sure. fucking aggressive. Like, well, I know, but they died naturally. I mean, maybe you just yeah, well, but you're not trying to yeah. eat one that you fucking found that died naturally. Someone you know had saying? to have. And if it dies naturally, it's gonna die in the water and get eaten up by like scavengers and shit, right? Now both, so if we were going to go hunt a hippo. Both he and Jack wrote under pseudonyms for this book. Where I think if we were to slow cook it, that all of that extra body weight would make I it think, amazing. I think again. smoke it more yes, than anything. I, yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yes. No, I get you. Uh, well, anyway, so they both wrote under pseudonyms for this book, uh, where William S. Burroughs became William Lee, which is a good pseudonym because the last name has changed, and then Jack Kerouac's pseudonym was just John Kerouac because he's a fucking idiot. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> They actually gave pseudonyms to all the characters in the in the book, as they were all based on real people. Uh, everyone except this one guy they knew named Joe Gold. 
They just kept his name in the book. It's a perfect name. They didn't well, want to waste it. <laughs> and, and while I was looking up who Joe was, I found that he was this crazy guy who at one point wrote the longest novel ever written called An Oral History of the Contemporary World until H- Henry Darger came along. I was along. about to say, I thought, yeah. E.E. Yeah. Uh, e. Cummings once even stood trial at a character witness to not have Joe committed. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, E.E. E. Cummings, beat beat poet. He's from this era. Oh, God. Anyway, the e. book. E.E. Cummings. <laughs> the book. And the hippos were boiled in their tanks, would be written with each author writing an alternating chapter, so they'd trade off after each one. But in the end, Burroughs didn't like the book and didn't agree to get it published. He said, quote, It wasn't sensational enough to make it nor was it well-written or interesting enough to make it from a purely literary point of view. I mean, he could just not write it because it had to do with a murder. He's not that smart. That he tried to... As you'll find out, not a smart person. Okay. If you haven't found out already, yeah. not in I mean, that would be the red flag <laughs> for me there on this idea. I'd be like, wait, ho- hold on. Somebody tosses you bloody pack of cigarettes and say, hey, it's from my murder victim. What do you do? He flushed it. <laughs> <laughs> Get the fuck out of my house. <laughs> Uh, people would try to publish it in uh, in later years, but no one knew who had the rights to it until New York Magazine published a quote from the book in 1976, and Burroughs sued them and won. So people were like, oh, okay, so he's got the rights to it. So anyway, that was William S. Burroughs' first foray into being a novelist, a book he refused to publish, and a part of me wishes he'd kept it that way. Now, Joan and William worked great as a couple so long as they were high, but their addiction soon led to Burroughs selling heroin in Greenwich Village. Within within a year, he was arrested for forging a narcotics prescription. Now, Joan got her psychiatrist... It's, like, extra shameful if you're, like, from a really... Your background is, like, really wealthy and you still end up, like, dealing drugs. You know what, though? It seems to happen a lot. I've met kids like that. But I think it's probably from people who, like... Well, yeah, they're all out of I'm my not, life. I'm not, I just want to be clear right now, that statement was not intended to mean I am currently meeting child drug dealers mm. in my 30s. No, but... <laughs> they're, uh, but rich kid yes. drug dealers, yes, <laughs> I have met quite a few of those. Yeah, yeah. No, it seems to me that it's always like, well, mom and dad got wealthy based on their own merit, which they didn't, and then they're like, I bet I could do the same thing but make it punk. And it's like, no... You're just sell- selling cocaine in Gresham. I think like, they just <laughs> think because they've never experienced any hardship that nothing bad can happen Exactly. To them, and then they yeah. get sent to jail. And it happens. Yeah. <laughs> and it's very rough for them. I think wh- but they never learn their lesson either, at least the ones that I have known. I was at a party in high school, and um, somebody introduced me to this dude that they called the everything guy. And I was like, oh, nice. and I was like wow, why do they call you the what? everything guy? He's like, because I sell every drug. If I were 16, oh boy, what a, what a friendship we would have. <laughs> and I was like, wow, man, how's that going? And he's like, well, I'm actually going to have to go to, I'm actually going to prison soon. And I was like, whoa, why? And he was like, well, I, I, I sell it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, you know, that makes sense. Like you should hit him up, man. See how he's doing. I mean, he was just like, <laughs> he was just like doing a bunch of like, well, wouldn't you, wouldn't you know what a bunch of calisthenic <laughs> workouts at the party and everything talking about how he was going to get Jack. So nobody would, you know, be able to mess with him in prison. That's a good thing. He was in Cub Scouts, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's like, don't, f- I don't know how well. I don't know how well that's going to work if you look super, super... Um, I don't know how well an 18, 19-year-old is going to fare against a bunch <laughs> of 30-year-old men, just regardless of how hard you work out, but I think you're about no, to have a bad time. No, it's all right, man. Don't get buff. Just get really uh, really athletic build. That That's not going to... <laughs> that's not going to... Calisthenics is going to make you pretty lean there, boy. It's <laughs> 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 not good. Uh, so, Joan... Joan she rounded out with some squats. Goddamn. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah, squat it out. Oh fuck. Now Joan got her psychiatrist. You joked about that. <laughs> Man. Joan got her psychiatrist to write a letter basically stating that he would watch over Burroughs if released from jail, as he saw this as a psychiatric matter, not a criminal one. So if he like he'll write the judge that Burroughs should be taken out of jail and I will watch him. I'll study him, right? Because now he's a test a test subject. I think I really got something here. Hmm. Well, it it did work. And Burroughs was released under the condition that he moved back in with his parents in St. Louis. And in a show of good faith, Burroughs decided to finally divorce Elsie Clapper, the German girl. Mm -hmm. Of course, he had no idea where she was at this point, which was an issue, but not in Mexico. Burroughs went to Mexico to file for divorce while Joan was hitting a new low with her Benzie addiction. You can file for divorce in different countries? Yeah. 
right? No. I, you know what? I've only ever heard of it getting done in Mexico. Nobody ever goes to Canada, but I have heard it being done in Mexico and in America. They will, um, they'll just say okay to it. Like if it got done huh. in Mexico, I don't know why that is. They're just like, yeah, it's cool. We're cool with that. Yeah, no, because I watched some. Uh, I watched some. Like I can't fly without a real ID, but for some reason. Yeah, you know, no, no, no. I <laughs> but for some reason I get fucking divorced in America and Mexico. All right. Yeah. Like, well, like I, I saw some uh, some true crime documentary where a dude like took a teenage girl down to Mexico where they were like, yep, you guys can get married. So they did. And then they had to they had to be OK with it in America, like legally. It was it was like, why, why? the fuck is somebody in America just like, damn, got me again. <laughs> Shit. In Mexico. Ah, those bastards. <laughs> dude, just don't file the paperwork. No, no, no. It's a matter of honor. Take my job very Make it to Mexico, and that's it. You can do whatever, apparently. (laughs) Fucking get divorced, marry children. It's over. (laughs) What the fuck? I should say that that documentary took place in, like, the 60s or 70s. I hope things are different now, but I kind of doubt it. One would assume. mm, How how well are... We have child marriages here. I don't think... I don't really feel comfortable, like, Googling that either. No, it's not going to my phone. I don't feel like... I don't even want to see, like, what my suggested ads are going to be after I look that up. Nicole, give me your mom's phone. I need to look something (laughs) up. (laughs) So, as he was in Mexico, Joan was hitting a new low with her addiction. She had a full-on psychotic episode that landed her in Bellevue Hospital. This was bad for her kid. Remember, she had a kid at this point from her marriage who was uh, at risk of being taken away. So when William heard about this, he immediately fled to New York where he got Joan released and immediately asked her to marry him. They never had a wedding, nor did they file paperwork, but in America, this is almost as good as the real thing and she became his common law wife. Still, she did like to go by Mrs. William Burroughs. So William and Joan decide to make for a new life, but it didn't last very long. They visited Burroughs' parents in St. Louis, then moved to Texas, but William was still a heroin addict and Joan was addicted to amphetamines. And when she ended up pregnant, no one slowed down. Oh, no, 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 no. In fact, all it meant to them was that William would have to go into town to score her some Benzies himself. Like, I can't do it. I'm pregnant. She's like, no, I'm going to make this work for me. <laughs> I, I, well, I got it fucking, I got to sit down. My back hurts. You know, go get me pills. Stop taking you know? amphetamines. <laughs> this isn't working. We're either an amphetamine couple or an opiate couple, okay? We can't be both. <laughs> yeah, this is really a toxic relationship when you think about it. When you really sit down and think about it, man, this is not a good thing. Like, and also, like, <laughs> We're you doing know, two different kinds of drugs. If here. you're wanting to be, like, an amph- and, you know, an amphetamine addicted, like, pregnant woman like definitely don't marry an opiate addict he's not gonna be able to go get you stuff he's gonna be nodding off god that fucking that jizz had to have been so coagulated just crawling its way Ugh. into the womb just god Ugh. anyway why, why? <laughs> no and on july 21st 1947 they had a son william seward burroughs the third or as he would be better known billy The family moved to New Orleans a year later in 1948, but were soon in trouble with the law. Wait, is the kid fucked up? Actually, he was fine. How the years in that kid? Well, he will... Oh, like, when does he die? No. What? I mean, like, how are the years on that kid? How are the years? You don't know about that? Oh, like what? How how he looks in the face? No. What? The fuck? No, the ears. You get, like, weird little... You get weird little elf ears, man. Oh! Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know. I like, think he was, but for the most part. going to have some developmental yeah. issues that are probably not going to show up until he's like I'm seven, sure. nine. I'm sure. Yeah, no, but you know, he, I won't say he ends up well, but I will say <laughs> that that was probably because of his parents, though, more than just what he may have been born with. But either way, I we'll mean, get that's into that. Both because of his parents, Jordan. Well, yes, no, I understand that. But I mean, like from a, it was more of a nurture versus nature type thing for him. But either way. Yeah, but I feel like their nurture directly affected his nature in the way of doing drugs while he was in the womb. All right. Anyway. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not going to argue with you about a person that you've known for two sentences. Anyway, the family moved to New Orleans a year later in 1948. I just want to know if he looks like a fucking goblin. No. Okay. But they were soon in trouble with the law. William was caught with heroin, and upon searching their home, the police found a letter from Allen Ginsberg about moving a large quantity of marijuana down to them to sell. When William was arrested, 
he was given a brief stint in a psychiatric hospital before making bail. In a desperate attempt to outrun the law, he made a run for Mexico. Now his marijuana. Did they have rehab facilities back then, or did they just throw them all together in one they, big group? Well, their rehab facilities, I want to say, were all in psychiatric hospitals, so that yeah, they, so were like, they were like, they were like, they were like, look, if you're going to be chill about this, you know, you get the rehab portion. If you're going to be a bit of, uh, well, a heroin addict about it, then uh, <laughs> you're going to get locked away. <laughs> you know, <laughs> either way, you're coming down. <laughs> no, 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 this is a mental health issue. Like, dude, he's. Re- He's, he's withdrawing from opiates, man. This is a very, very serious physical issue. Like, no, 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 no. Mental <laughs> hospital. Get him in there. <laughs> what? Now, his marijuana charge was large enough that had William and Joan gone back to Texas or St. Louis or New York, he'd still have a warrant out for his arrest, and they would find him. Wait, does it work like that still? You can just leave the state? Um, well, it depends on if it's like a misdemeanor or a felony. He, he had a felony charge. Okay. If you have a small amount of pot found on you in like, San, well, I don't know what states have it legal anymore, but somewhere that it's not legal, mm-hmm. if it's a small amount, then they're going to be like, this doesn't need to follow him back to back home, you know, to even to another state where it's illegal, doesn't matter. But if it's large enough to start selling on the streets, yeah, we want you back here. Yeah, the, the, in, <laughs> the intent to sell thing. Yeah. yeah. So he, <clears throat> wait, where was I? Oh, yeah, yeah. So he he knew that if he got caught, it did mean big boy prison for him as well, not jail. He'd be going to, like, big old federal prison. So in 1950... You almost did it, didn't you? mm, Yep. So in 1950, at the age of 36, William S. Burroughs found a place to stay in Mexico City. And soon after, Joan and the kids would follow. The intention was to stay in Mexico City for five years until the statute of limitations on William's crime would run out and they could return safely to America. Oh my God, so it is like it is like GTA. Yes. Except it takes years. Uh-huh. But due to a bad party trick, William S. Burroughs would be forced to flee Mexico as well. Now, what by, was the party uh, trick? Oh, well, you'll see. Did it involve a pinky? <laughs> Damn it, I'm out. <laughs> oh, oh. No, by all accounts, they tried. William and Joan fucking tried. They knew the drugs were bad. They knew they were bad people. They figured maybe Mexico was the first chapter of the rest of our lives. Like, you had to flee your fucking home. And they were like, you know, when I really look in the mirror now, I don't see me. I don't see who I used to be. I don't see who I like. I, you know... Maybe it's time to change. <laughs> like they really but then I do drugs again, it. and I feel great. <laughs> well, so they, they cut the drugs, but the withdrawals being as bad as they were, they picked up drinking instead, mostly at a place called the Bounty Bar, which was run by some Americans they'd met and befriended and who lived above the establishment. Now, Allen Ginsberg didn't see their exodus to Mexico as a problem. In fact, he saw promise in William's letters to him. He told William that he should write a novel, and at first he thought it was stupid, but the same year that he and Joan fled to Mexico, Jack Kerouac had released his first novel, The Town and the City. Sure, it wasn't a success, but it could be done. So Burroughs, yeah? What? Oh, no. I was, oh, I thought you were raising no, your I, hand. No, I was just putting my hand up because I was feeling, dude, is there central AC in here? Yeah. <gasps> I know. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's so much better. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> so Sorry, listeners. So... Jack Kerouac's first book, it, it wasn't a success, but, you know, it, it could be done. So Burroughs, he started to write his own story, a little autobiographical, a little fiction. The story would be called Junk. An eye novel, if you will. If you will. Yes, actually. Very good. Uh, <laughs> the story would be called Junk, after the street name for heroin. Now, getting a recovering heroin addict and alcoholic to sit the fuck down and write a story from a whole ass country away was, as Allen Ginsberg discovered, quite hard. The writings Burroughs sent him were disjointed and extremely rough, but Ginsberg knew it was good. He just had to clean it up a little. So what he did was have William start a companion piece to Junk called Queer. Basically, the things that wouldn't make sense to be in Junk he had him file in the queer folder instead. <laughs> <laughs> I had fun writing that part. And in between writing sessions, William went to class. Uh, His episode belongs in the queer folder. <laughs> Whole show. And in between, <laughs> in between writing sessions, William went to classes at Mexico City College, learning Spanish and even older unused dialects like Mayan. 
He actually studied Mayan quite well and was a good student to the head of the anthropology department, a man named Robert H. Barlow, who was a personal friend to H.P. Lovecraft and the literary executor to his estate. They went on trips to the Temple of Quetzalcoatl. He even studied the Mayan codices, uh, hieroglyphic tablets from the pre-Columbian era. Like, he really had his hands on, like, cool shit. Unfortunately, R.H. Barlow was afraid of his homosexuality being outed by a student and killed himself at 32. But Barlow's work with Burroughs would serve as a recurring inspiration in his later writings. Now, Joan was taking things a little worse than William was while they were in Mexico. She was a worse alcoholic than he was and would tear into him any chance she got, especially in public. Someone who studied Burroughs' life actually found papers that divorce had been filed almost as soon as they got to Mexico, but whoever <laughs> filed it later retracted it. Hey, can't get divorced in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you can marry kids, you can do whatever. Look, but it's a wild place, okay? <laughs> Everything's topsy-turvy here. <laughs> You can marry children, but you can't get divorced from the children. <laughs> <laughs> it, seemed that, it seemed that they both wanted out, but they also both wanted the kids. Joan was also pissed that William had been gallivanting with some of the local men. Though from what I can tell... If you're a drug addict, fuck off. You don't get the kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I could tell, though, they were both a bit liberal in that way. Like, they would fool around. They were swinging. I just don't think that each other wanted the other person to swing. They just wanted to be the only swinger. <laughs> I feel like what was probably happening was they had built a life where they were relying on each other in codependency, so they mm. couldn't live without each other, but yeah. they also weren't happy um, intimately with each other, so they were forced to look outside of that relationship to fill that void. Yeah, and look at that. They found a nice, normal people to be with uh, until those people were also like, Man, you're just a full-blown heroin addict, aren't you? <laughs> and they're like, oh, back to the codependency. No, 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 no. I'm not a heroin addict anymore. Now I'm an alcoholic, a raging alcoholic. Oh, cool. Yeah, no. Mm -mm. Um, I liked you better when you couldn't punch me. <laughs> like, I think at one point, William S. Burroughs had, like, gone for a month or two down to South America with someone, like some dude, and just fucked around with him, like, around South America and just came back like... Yeah, anyway, so how were the kids? Cool, cool, cool. You know, like, that's not a healthy relationship. Well, granted... We gonna... Nope, not gonna address this. <laughs> so, granted, all of these things seem like perfect motives for this next part. But I would like to start by saying that I think this incident was a complete accident. On September 6th, 1951, mm -hmm. as they partied with the owners of the Bounty Bar in their upstairs apartment... Burroughs supposedly said something to the effect of, it's time for our William Tell act. Do you know who William Tell is? Yeah, I mean, I know the little the little jingle. Yeah, you, you shoot an apple off a boy's head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of like how we did drunk less than two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so the shaky and drunk William S. Burroughs brandished his gun, and the shaky and drunken Joan Volmer stood at a wall placing a highball glass on her head, and stood there. William lined up the shot and shot Joan Vollmer in the fucking head. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <clears throat> Woo! Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I did see the one death photo online of the crime scene. It's not hard to find for those of you that are curious, but it doesn't look like she was shot in the forehead or anything. I think the bullet actually hit her on the top of her head. So if you think William meant to kill her, he missed the forehead by quite a bit, but he only missed the glass by like an inch. Okay, regardless of whether or not you mean to do that in that situation, not, you still fucking not, did that. <laughs> like, you're, you're still going to jail for murder. Yes. No, like, I am not on William S. Burroughs' side at all on anything. I didn't mean to. Matter. I was just trying to shoot something <laughs> off her head. No, I'm just saying, dude, that's not defense. The, the no. argument still goes on today that, like, he meant to kill her, and it's like, I get it. And from all backstories, they hated each other at this point. I really don't think that he meant to, though. They're just both fucking morons. <laughs> like, well, regardless. Doesn't matter, though. No. Honestly. Joan died several hours later at the age of 28. As much as little three-year-old Billy Burroughs would later say he saw the, un the events unfold, he was thankfully never there. Neither kid was. When the police arrived, William claimed to have had somewhere between eight to ten drinks, though witnesses say it was more like two or three. 
He was held in jail while his older brother made his way to Mexico. Well, t- 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 <clears throat> witnesses. It was in a bar full of people. <laughs> well, well, hang, hang, hang on, hang on, hang on. Look, as look, somewhat of a connoisseur of alcohol myself, <laughs> I can tell you that um, the amount of drinks I have had is not limited to what you have seen since I've shown up mm, to the bar. Mm-hmm. Okay. No, you know what? That's a very good point. I'm sure it probably was eight to ten. He showed up. Plastered, I'll get primed. Sure. I'll get primed on a whole fucking six or tall boys before I go out for the evening. Yes, okay? and then when you show up, Caleb, did you drink before this? No, I did not. Boom. Perfect lie. Boom. They don't even smell it on you. <laughs> They're like, are you sure about that guy who's notorious for blacking out at parties? Guy, Absolutely. Guy who you know <laughs> for a fact when he when he's had too much to drink, blinks one eye at a time. <laughs> <laughs> well, this eye was tired, but the other one wasn't. You know. <laughs> No, I'm good. I'm straight. Uh-huh. <laughs> Look, dude, I got shit to do. Stop fucking around. Give me my keys. Blink, blink. <laughs> Just like a lizard. What? <laughs> Them's fighting words. So he was held in jail while his older brother made his way to Mexico with essentially a bag full of cash from mom and dad. You know, he, he bribed the lawyer, who in turn bribed the judges, the ballistic experts, and the detectives. Like, it was a lot of money. Burroughs changed his story to... Actually, I dropped the gun, per his lawyer's instructions, but when asked why he had a loaded gun in the first place, they again changed the story to, Actually, I was selling the gun to a friend at the party, and I didn't know it was loaded, and it just went off. This was a good enough story for the court. The, That's the, amazing! Right? Mexico! <laughs> Where you can get away with murder and marry children. All right, everybody. All right, all right, all right. All right. Shh, calm down. Nobody else wants to be here pretending that we care about a woman that was just shot, all right? Nobody cares about the drunk American. Just get him out, please. <laughs> the lawyer even coached two of the party goers to act as witnesses to the new story. Altogether, William S. Burroughs spent 13 days in jail. That's not bad. <laughs> but when Jones... When Joan's parents heard what happened, they were given the original story, the William Tell one, and they knew that was the truth because yeah. they knew exactly what kind of... it doesn't sound like bullshit. They, they knew exactly what kind of people both their daughter and her husband was. They said it couldn't have happened any other way. This incident was actually captured in the television show Archer where Arthur Woodhouse, the old man, is seen in a flashback with a gun saying, let's living things up, Burroughs. Five grams of junk says I can shoot a pina colada off your wife's head. (laughs) (laughs) I thought that was funny. (laughs) Uh, That's good. (laughs) Uh God damn. Go on. Now, for a year, Burroughs had to report every Monday morning to the Mexico City Jail while the finer things were filed with the right people and William's lawyer. However, one day Burroughs shows up and his lawyer's not there. They're like, oh, yeah, he fled to Brazil. And he was like, what? From what? Yeah, he, some kid accidentally scratched his Cadillac, so he shot the kid. What? <laughs> No, I mean, some kid some kid scratched his Cadillac and then a gun he was going to sell um, that he didn't know was loaded <laughs> just went off. So now he's in a third world country and his one safety is gone. So Burroughs took a cue from his lawyer's playbook and decided to just run away back to Louisiana. If he was going to prison either way, he figured he may as well serve it in America, right? Well, as he found out when... No, no, dude. Well, as opposed to a Mexican prison, do you really think it's worse? Yeah, I, don't. I do. <laughs> I, I, you know what, Louisiana though. Mm, yeah, either or. <laughs> oh man, yeah, no. Well, as he found out when he got there, the warrant for his arrest for his previous charge of heroin possession was never filed. He was originally going to stay in Mexico for five years because of the statute of limitations, but as it turned out. He could have just hung around and nothing would have happened because they forgot to file the fucking paperwork. Mexico, on the other hand, saw a manslaughter charge run to America, convicted him of such, but basically just gave him time served in a suspended sentence, so they didn't care. (laughs) He could also just go back to Mexico now if he wanted. He was a free man, but the mother of his child is dead, you know? Where are his kids right now? With him. Oh, actually, no. Um, before he'd left Mexico, William buried Joan Volmer in Mexico City with her parents in attendance. Uh, he let them take the kids. Let with, them, huh? Uh, you know, I'll allow it. 
Um, where they then send Joan's kid from the previous marriage to live with her dad's parents, probably a good decision, mm -hmm. and little Billy was taken in by Joan's folks. Now, this isn't the last will here of Billy, but it's the last will here from the daughter. By all accounts, she did not want to be involved in Burroughs' infamy, and she died, a quiet, uh, died quiet in 2010 at age 66. No interviews, nothing. Good for her. Because <laughs> when Billy comes back, ah. <clears throat> so... After finding himself with a new lease on life, with no authorities looking for him, and no hang-ups like kids or a wife, William decided to drift through South America for several months in search of a drug that allegedly gave its user telepathic abilities. Oh, we're back He's to back this. on this. Oh, fuck yeah, dude. <laughs> because although I won't mention it every time he talks about it, William was a constant believer in magic and the supernatural. He knew the drug he was looking for as Yage, but it would today be better known as did can, Ayahuasca. Did he consider that maybe it just made you fucking think you were telepathic? Uh, yeah. I, have you seen the videos of dudes in, like, South America on Ayahuasca? Don't you, like, throw it up and shit? Well, they, like, sit you in a little river to cool you down because your fucking body temperature skyrockets. And, like, half those people try to drown themselves <laughs> in, like, a little trickle of water. It's insane. I don't want to do it. <laughs> I feel like that's, like, one of those things that, like, climbing Everest, like, it's never somebody from a normal background. You know, it's always somebody right. who's had things really fucking easy. Yeah, I could do this. This seems like a challenge. <laughs> Buddy, you will die. <laughs> I need to validate something. <clears throat> Now, we don't know exactly how Burroughs' search for ayahuasca was, because although the letters between himself and Allen Ginsberg would be collected and published 10 years later in 1963 in a collection called The Yage Letters, it would be discovered in 2006 that while the trip itself did happen, Burroughs and Ginsberg bullshitted the entirety of their correspondence to make themselves look cooler than they really were. If anything, The Yage Letters is just another collaborative novel by both Ginsberg and Burroughs. Now, when Burroughs came back to the U.S., he made his way to New York. And at this point, the news of what had happened to Joan was everywhere. The little friend group that Allen Ginsberg had amassed were now split on whether to call the whole incident an accident or a murder. You know, or it could be both. A lot of people didn't believe William's story and stopped speaking to uh, him I mean, altogether. Um, no, it's murder. It is. It is. Well, it's manslaughter. Well, if no, you don't mean to yeah, murder, yeah, but it's still it's murder. Yeah, yeah, it's a like, subset of murder. Murder doesn't <laughs> necessarily mean that you intended to kill somebody, right? Well, and a lot of these people felt the same way, but a good chunk of them were like, "No, he just wanted her dead," so they just stopped speaking to him altogether. But the friends who had visited Burroughs and Joan while they lived in Mexico all said the same thing: Joan Volmer was suicidal. Now, there's no way she orchestrated the incident, of course, but. Atlan Ginsberg started telling people that's exactly what happened. I mean, to be fair, I mean, if you have placed a bottle upon your head to let someone shoot it off, in this situation, there are kind of two people responsible here. You know what, though? I also think that they had done this in the past. If he's saying, it's time for our William Tell Act, and she, without a word, goes up, <laughs> does it? I think they were doing this shit at home. <laughs> Probably. Uh, yeah, but no, he, Alan Ginsberg said that she got in the way of the goddamn bullet. That it was, like, her fault completely. Like, she just kind of did a little hop or something, you know, <laughs> to, like, get shot. How fucking hard it would be to time a hop with I a know. trigger pull. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, unless he was going three, two, one. Uh, one hop! <laughs> <laughs> and Burroughs, he was pissed about that, though. He he blamed himself more than anyone else. As he, he, <laughs> as he should, you know. The incident, though, it fucking broke him. He wrote to Alan, accusing his own subconscious of somehow making him aim down slightly. He believed this to be an actual possession, calling the evil inside him the ugly spirit. And I'm not kidding, he really believed the ugly spirit was just this evil entity. He actually tried to get shamans to exercise it out of him at hey, one buddy, point. Hey buddy, maybe you're just an evil entity. <laughs> maybe it's just you. Maybe the evil entity was inside you all along. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> Whoa. Wow, dude. While all of this was going on, as much as Allen Ginsberg... <laughs> it's like, no, 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 you don't get to, like, shirk responsibility even just in your own head saying it's not you. Yeah, no, like, it was my subconscious. No, you did it, though. Yeah, my subconscious. Yeah, you. <laughs> <laughs> you dumbass. It's still you, buddy. So while all this was going on, Allen Ginsberg at least pretended to care for his friend. 
he was still trying to establish the beat generation as a legitimate movement. Like, he didn't want it to slow down. He liked his little position of pseudo power. He at least had a hand in getting Jack Kerouac's novel published, so he tried just as hard with William S. Burroughs and the novel he'd been writing, Junk. But Burroughs was done with it. He didn't really seem to care. Yet Ginsburg continued. Back when Burroughs had that brief stint at a psych ward in Louisiana, Ginsburg had actually met a guy there who knew a guy who knew the owner of a small publishing company that had just started in 1952 called Ace Books. Remember, this was Ginsburg's talent. He'd find connections and connect the dots to what he wanted. Now, Ace Books primarily worked through kiosks and subways alongside newspapers, porno, detective novels, and their main competitor, comic books. Mainly, Ace published mysteries and westerns, but recently, they'd been having a string of successes with their sci-fi. They would go on to publish Philip K. Dick, Ursula K. Le Guin, Frank Herbert, but for now, they were just enjoying their middling success. But when Allen Ginsberg spoke with them, he convinced them that maybe juvenile delinquent stories were an untapped market as well. So they took a chance and they said, okay, give us the story and we'll see how it goes. And as great of news as this was, Burroughs never finished the goddamn story, but with a little help from Ginsburg, he did. Learning that he actually had a chance to publish something, Burroughs quickly finished the script. Apparently, Ginsburg and Kerouac... Script? Yeah, like the actual manuscript for the novel. Oh. Yeah. And apparently, both Ginsburg and Kerouac, they both wanted him to put in the stuff about him killing his wife, but he was, for some reason, very against that. <laughs> he was Weird. like, I kind of don't want to, and they're like, no, man, it would... Oh. Can you imagine, like, how real that is? He's like, yeah, dude, it's because it's real, and it happened, and I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> it's, it's a very real crime that I very much did in reality that I could go to very fucking real prison for, so no, I will not be discussing that. Now, Ace books were not, by any, mo- by any means, high society literature. In fact, most libraries refused to hold them. The books themselves were supposed to be, like, more bang-for-your-buck type deals where you pay a low price and actually get two books because both ends of the book jacket were actually the front cover. Ooh, I get two pieces of shit instead of one. Yeah. You see, on one side, you'd have Junk by William Lee, and on the other, you'd have Narcotic Agent by Maurice Helbrand, and the last pages of each book were somewhere in the middle. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. These books were, like comic books, meant to be thrown away after reading. In fact, that's why the double-sided editions of Junk are so goddamn expensive. The only copies to survive the times were ones somebody had thrown in a box by mistake and just forgotten to be thrown away. That's the story with old comics, too. That's why those are so rare. Now, upon receiving the script, Ace Books accepted it, but with some changes. There were references to William Burroughs' homosexuality, which they instantly nixed. And this will be a constant issue with Burroughs, but basically... His editors did take a bunch of shit. Like, look, man, we think you should put in some stuff about you murdering your wife, but that gay stuff, (laughs) it's not going to (laughs) sell. They had had an issue with it, for sure, you know. But Burroughs, he, he would do this thing. His editors would take a bunch of shit out of the novel that didn't really have any place there. Like, quote, Lee saw penises grow centipede legs, others moving about like jointed caterpillars. Lee watched curiously. Very artistic, he said in a pansy voice. He did not feel fear. (laughs) Jesus. Or how about, quote, When I am on junk, I take pleasure in tormenting and terrorizing cats. I hold a cat out the window or provoke the unfortunate animal into biting or scratching, then slap it across the face with brutal force. I give the cats a bath and hold their heads underwater. I really don't like him now. Probably a bit much for audiences in 1953. Yeah, I think I had you with the penis growing legs and then just the cat thing, which is funny because he had cats for like the entirety of his life. Oh, I wonder why. He fucking loved cats, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) fucking yeah, he did. (laughs) The, The most important change, however, was the title. No one wants to pick up a book that instantly invokes of a sense, invokes a sense of the book being shitty. Calling a book junk was just as bad as calling it garbage. So the company changed the title to how it would forever be known, as Junkie. Or in its longer title, Junkie, Confessions of an Unredeeming Drug Addict. That's Junkie with an I-E, by the way. England got the J-U-N-K-Y, but not America well, for I don't some give reason. a shit. Just want to let you know. 
I would sp- just, oh my God. It's like color with a U. The shit you will put into this <laughs> goddamn show, dude. <laughs> anyway. Fucking a, be sele- why don't you be fucking selective about what does and doesn't fucking go into this? <laughs> Man, right? Un- unironically, I, I put so much of his shit in here and was just like, I need to get rid of this. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just don't want to repeat some of the shit he says. Anyway, <clears throat> the book itself is actually pretty straightforward, which you'll find surprising later given his other ones. It's literally the account of a junkie. Nothing super special in the writing, honestly, but it is competent. The book obviously draws partially from William's life, but to what extent, we don't really know. Burroughs would have you believe the entire thing is real, but we know for a fact it's not. There are snippets of reality in it, though, like this thing he mentions in the beginning of the novel where he says that he was committed and the doctors thought he was a paranoid schizophrenic because he mentioned that he was just like Van Gogh. You know, because he was institutionalized as well. Mm -hmm. And they were like, who's Van Gogh? And he was like, seriously? The famous painter? And for whatever reason, literally no one at the facility had ever heard of Van Gogh before, and they thought he was a figment of Burroughs' imagination. At first, people thought this was just another part of Junkie that Burroughs had made up, because who the fuck doesn't know Van Gogh? But when William S. Burroughs became much more famous, a scholar found his files at the facility and they actually wrote that part down. Like, is Van Gogh in the room with us right now? <laughs> <laughs> they were like, he believes in someone named Van Gogh. Like, they really <laughs> hadn't heard of him. <laughs> I mean, I would feel fucking like, crazy, too, though. I'd be like, are you fucking Van Gogh? Guys, Starry Night? Like, and they're like, dude, we've never know. fucking heard of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. Imagine how much more fucking insane. Like, what kind of, like, weird shit horror movie ending is that when you get out of the psych ward and you're like, and they're like, oh, man. And and somebody comes up to you and they're like, hey, man, you want to go see the Van Gogh exhibit? And you're like, wait, what? I I, I fucking, no, it's not real. It's it's Van Gogh's not fucking real. I would be so fucking mad. I mean, imagine what kind of a dickhead was working there, the one guy who has heard of Van Gogh. And And he's like, like, yeah, dude, that's wild. And it's just the one dude who's just like, no, Van Gogh, I never heard of that before in my life. Like, you know, <laughs> this will asshole. really get him. <laughs> if there wasn't something wrong with it before, just, it will be now. Yeah, it's just written down in a file. If you pretend that you haven't heard of, like, you know, Van Gogh, then he fucking starts screaming, and it's really, really funny. <laughs> 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 but while the book is just a regular tell all of a heroin addict going into the daily life of pickpocketing passengers in the subway and stealing prescription pads at doctor's offices, it does end with the narrator trying to kick the habit to something non-habit forming, like pot, but something that'll give him the same kick as heroin. The book ends with, maybe I will find in Yage what I was looking for in junk and weed and coke. Yage may be the final fix. So looking back, it ends just before he left for Mexico. Man, wouldn't it be great if the if I could just feel really good from the drugs without any of the bad <laughs> things happening? Wow, man, that is a deep thought. <laughs> like, wow, boy, if as if humanity has not been looking for that that if miracle drug. I could drug feel all forever. the benefits of heroin without it being bad for me. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, look, me too. I've never even done it, but let me tell you, we all want it, <laughs> but we know it doesn't exist, idiot. <laughs> oh, there's also at the back of the book. There's a cute little glossary um, called Jive Talk. It helps you understand it, <laughs> you know, like, like what's an eight ball or like, you know, what's the age and shit, you know, it tells you all that. <laughs> it's cute. <laughs> Jive talk. The book sold pretty okay for what it was. 113,170 copies by the end of 1953 alone, though Burroughs would barely see any royalties from it. Ginsburg had another problem with it, though. He looked at the magazine stalls in Times Square 42nd Street, and Greenwich Village, all of which were popular places to score heroin, and none of them were selling junkie. He thought Ace clearly didn't know how to market, though to be fair, I don't think they were expecting to peddle the novel to junkies as their main audience. Yeah, I think they were probably expecting to sell a cheap novel to people on the fucking subway, you know, but Allen Ginsberg was like, look at this, all these junkies... And it's an untapped market. And they're like, buddy, no, it's it's supposed to be a tell-all about how junk is no, bad. No, the junkie doesn't <laughs> care about you telling junkie stories. <laughs> yeah, he's not going to be like, wow, just like me. Yeah. And if you'll remember, there was a companion piece that Burroughs was working on back in Mexico City called Queer, which was basically all the unused bits he had left over from junkie. But Burroughs didn't even try to get it published. Jack Kerouac championed the book, saying that it would appeal to, quote, the East Coast homosexual literary critics. <laughs> you know, those guys. <laughs> but 
But still, Burroughs buried the novel. At this point, his legal problems in the past made him an unwanted tenant anywhere he wanted to live. Not anywhere, period, but anywhere he wanted to be. Like, as a rich kid, you know? Yeah. So, the best he could do are the shitty little burrows. And he's like, but I don't want to live with the rats. And it's like, well, you act like a rat long enough, dude. You got to live with them. Sorry. And anyway, eventually, he went to live with Allen Ginsberg in New York City. But eventually, Allen came on to William who kindly denied his advances, but it made him feel a bit used, you know? So Burroughs decided what he wanted was to clear his head in Rome with his friend Alan Anson. Anson was a friend to everyone in the beat scene, and his parents were filthy rich too. They were supporting Anson while he traveled, and Burroughs basically asked Anson's parents if they could just do the same for him. Like, and they're like, yeah, sure you go. Yeah, no, they did. Oh, <laughs> Burroughs and Anson traveled throughout Europe for the next couple months until they came to Morocco. And here, in the port city of Tangier, William S. Burroughs found a place he felt he truly belonged. The people in the culture were chill, sure, but most importantly, there were a lot of drugs. Specifically pot, something called majun, which is basically an edible, and a German drug called eucodol which is just Oxycontin, but from Germany. And actually... Which just gave Opie, it's a silly German name. Well, you know, it's not really Champagne if it's not coming from Champagne region of France. And, you know, this is Eucadol. It's like Oxycontin, but it's from the Eucadol region of Germany. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, while Burroughs was here, his son Billy had grown up, barely a teenager. And Joan's parents, who took Billy in, they wrote to Burroughs saying that maybe it was time for him to get connected with his son, you know? So they sent little Billy over to over to Morocco, where Burroughs immediately introduced him to pot. <laughs> Burroughs thought maybe drugs would be their father-son connection. What the fuck else is he supposed to connect with somebody about, <laughs> honestly? Like, well, let me tell you. My brother told me that, like, yeah, one time mom caught me smoking pot, and she was like, oh, maybe... I'll join and it'll be cool and I'll be the cool mom. And he was like, dude, it was the worst experience of my life. Like nobody wants to be high around their mom. Who's also high. Like what the fuck? <laughs> she, just, like, she just sat in and he was just like, uh, yeah, no, actually I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm good. No, 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 it's not you. It's just, I, uh, I'm done. You know, I, I'm just, I'm who boy. I'm too high. Yeah, usually right, this is the part later. when I jack off. So, <laughs> but although Burroughs, Oh, um, yeah, here's, so here's the thing. He he gave him drugs to try and form a connection as, like, a father, but he's not a fucking real father. He didn't give a shit if his kid walked around town by himself, which he did. And after a run-in with a couple dudes who tried to rape Billy, supposedly friends of his dad's even, Billy was like, you know what? Send me back to Pop Pop and Gam Gam. I'm done. You know? <laughs> Billy left Morocco after what I think was just a few weeks with nothing more than trauma and a new drug addiction. This is what I meant by, like, Billy would have probably been fine had he not just kept getting reintroduced to his own dad. <laughs> yeah. During the next three years, Burroughs would write several more stories which would be collected into two books. He would also amass what he called the word hoard. Basically, what this was was a thousand pages of absolute nonsense. What Burroughs would do is just get fucking higher than shit and start typing out anything that came to mind. He said that when he liked something, but it had to be scrapped from one draft to the next, he would add it to the word hoard. So this was basically his cutting room floor in a file. And almost every story he ever made from this point forward would draw from this mammoth pile of papers. Just random shit. But from November of 1954 until 1957, William S. Burroughs would write two books, Interzone, a collection of short stories that wouldn't even be published until 1989, and his magnum opus, The Weird, Twisted Tale of Naked Lunch. My sources today, Junkie by William S. Burroughs, Grove Press 2003, and Wikipedia. We're doing two-parter with this? Oh, fuck yeah. He's too fucked up. We can't do it in one. <laughs> he doesn't stop becoming a piece of shit as he gets older, let me tell you. He just ages like a fine wine. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever heard of Naked, piece of shit. Naked Lunch. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Heard of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's not good. But anyway, <laughs> we're going to get into that hole. 
cacophony of bullshit later. But uh, yeah, man. So don't uh, look if you're playing with firearms, do it like towards a hill or something. <laughs> And from a short distance. Speaking and from experience with, there, Jordan, perhaps not, experience you've had within the past two years? No, uh, way, way more than two years. All and right. also with nobody on your left or right side, that's like, <laughs> you know, the gun safety is important. <laughs> uh, hey, with any luck, you know, someone will listen to it and like file it away, but then just forget to file it. And <laughs> the fucking... <laughs> the file it away, just, just don't file it onto the top of your head and have somebody else shoot at it. <laughs> 